Becoming Awesome with Peter D. Expand your consciousness. Hello, welcome to Becoming Awesome. I'm your host, Peter D. We have a special guest today, Leela Lake. Leela has created the We Warrior blog, which when I first read it, I just could not stop reading. It just opened up so many doors of perception for me. So we're going to be getting into enjoying an in-depth conversation on how history has literally been recreated and what we're taught may not even be close to what really is. Now, Leela, welcome today. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Thank you. So here's a little bit about Leela. She was born and raised in Texas by journalists who rubbed their elbows with some notorious bigwigs, giving her a chance to see firsthand the nonsense that goes on behind the scenes. She's worked in government, high-tech companies, and private entrepreneurs. She ran a no-kill cat sanctuary in Hawaii for five years, which is why I put myself in front of the window with the cat wall in the background to celebrate yay cats. All right. Uh, in 2008, Leela started the We Warrior blog and just to present some of the wild results of her research. And this process led her to asking even tougher and tougher questions with unexpected connections that we're going to be covering today from modern stargates to Atlantis rising to ancient civilizations right here in the Americas very recently. So let me welcome Leela Lake. Thank you. Why don't you start off by telling us just a little bit about yourself? Uh, as you mentioned, I was raised in Texas, and um, because of the kind of work my parents did, I saw a lot of things behind the scenes. Uh, for example, I used when I was six, I saw Paul Harvey, and I was very impressed with him, as we all were back then, and got backstage to meet him. And as he came off the stage, he turned to his aide, and he said, well, that should keep the ignorant sons of bitches happy. Who's next? <laughs> it just scored me. I, I, I pulled my hand back and looked at him, and he just brushed me off like a little girl. But I stood there going, hey, <laughs> uh, I thought you were a great guy. So that was really my first big wake-up call. Yeah, no kidding. And I, went ahead and I was going to be a journalism major, but by the time I got there, it was a nightmare. Uh, nothing at all what I'd been raised with. So I went and studied everything I could find, history anthropology, sociology, philosophy, geography, geology, I took it all. So you're literally, finally, you're literally the Renaissance woman, you know, you well, taught yourself I, widely. Well, I did. I, I, I had to argue with them to get out of college. They said I had to graduate with a degree, and I said I don't want a degree. I don't want to specialize in any of these things. But they gave me the social science degree, which served me well. And then I went out and worked for the man for quite a while and wound up finding out that didn't work too well because I am a natural born whistleblower. And I tend to point out things that are wrong and that doesn't make jobs last too long or companies either, I found out. Right. So, so uh, you, you have this great background in like corporate America, living the American mm -hmm. dream, but you're not satisfied and you start nope. researching and finding nope. things out that you're posting on the We Warrior blog. Mm -hmm. Tell me what led you to that calling. Um, I've got to say it, it was a personal realization that I had to know more. I had to know more. I had to get out of the corporate thing, and that's when I went out and joined the Golden Rule Monastery, which is a lovely thing. It was only a dozen people, and we taught each other how to live by the Golden Rule and how to ignore what society tells us. And using that as a background, I was there for a year. I um, and, and the way they opened my mind up to new possibilities, I took off on this just uh, exploration that led me to see things that weren't explainable. Mm. And we'll uh, take one of my blogs is about having an experience in New Mexico. Uh, yeah, in New Mexico, Southern Colorado, right over there. Um, where I felt like I went into some kind of time shift driving by the Great Sand Dunes Desert. And that made me realize such things were possible. And I started investigating stargates. I thought, what a silly thing. Well, it turned out to not be so silly. 
there was a lot of evidence. And then that led me into studying the Atlantis rising idea, the idea that history as it is presented to us is not at all what we've been told. Right. Before we get into exploring some of those topics like Stargates and Atlantis Rising, when I was reading your bio, you mentioned that you went to Tinawaku uh, and had an experience there. And I've been to Tinawaku and I'd love to know uh, just a little bit about you. Let me tell everybody listening and watching that uh, it's the second largest pyramid in the world and it's still mostly buried. Only one face of it has been uncovered. It's right next to a sunken temple, which uh, is you know, maybe the size of four basketball courts and it's deep in the ground. And on the walls of the sunken temple are busts, relief busts of every species of human on the planet and many species of human not on the planet, like the greys and the ETs were there from centuries ago. Uh, what was your experience like at Tinawaku? Excellent. Interesting. Well, I don't know if we're talking about the same site. Was this the one that's an uh, hour outside of Mexico City? Oh, no, no. This was, uh, oh, no. This was down in okay. South America. Oh, okay. I mispronounced your bio then. So tell me about your experience, and I'll tell a little bit more about my okay. Stargate experience at Tinawaka, but tell me about yours. Teotihuacan, I went there when I was uh, 14. Yeah, I didn't want to go. I was drugged there by my parents. I didn't want to go. And, uh, but the minute I looked down in that valley, I was... I was just, I was turned on. I, something snapped in my brain that went, wait a minute, this is not at all what I'm being told. And we, this was like 1969. Mm -hmm. So there, it was not very developed and they had a little bitty tourist center there that we went into. It was all dark and cold. And then they let us out in the plaza and they had taken down all of the, um, the heads of, piece of codal and all that that used to line the pyramid mm -hmm. take them all down and line them up for restoration and they walked us in between those heads facing each other and something happened wow so just the energy of being be between those stones shifted you yeah it did i felt like i was examined and people went oh look we could turn that on and we could turn that on oh she'll be fine now it's really by the time i walked that two minutes through that row of statues that's how i felt and it well, that's never... fabulous that's fabulous i was interested in that because when i was at the other my mistake tina waku in uh in uh, uh bolivia okay and i was there and i saw this big large slab and i thought you know and the guys were saying you know just the normal stuff, all like sacrifice and stuff. I go, no, 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 this is a portal. I ran and got my wife and I said, do you feel this energy here? And she goes, oh yeah, I do. And I go, I feel like I can connect. So I did. And I just started instantly being in contact with entities that I believe were ple pleadians. And this is way before I had the ability to just tap into uh, uh, consciousness and beings and that kind of mm -hmm. things, you know? Uh, so I just had that and they wanted again, give me an upgrade kind of like what I'm hearing you say. They just say, here, mm -hmm. here's a gift. Just tug on the back of your ear. So you'll remember that that's, uh, that's where, uh, you know, if you'll have a physical thing to remember, tug on the back of your ear and then you'll just automatically go into the frequency where you can connect and talk with us. No, so excellent. ever since then, I'm like, there's so much more to the world than we're seeing and being mm -hmm. told. Uh, so now let's go into some of your research, please. And mm -hmm. tell me about some of these topics that you've uh, had. You've got these blogs, and, and I really want to direct readers to your website. And, and uh, Can you just say the name of the website for everybody, please? It's the WordPress blog website, and it's called We Warrior. When I read your blogs, they're like very detailed. I mean, it's like it's not like a, a, like a little five-minute thing. There's like no, no, tons kind of, of links and pages, and I'm like, oh, my God, there's so much research here. So tell me out of all that, some of the, the things that excite you most that you found. Well, I suppose the one thing that really got me going is the idea that there were civilizations in the Americas before Columbus arrived. I don't mean the mound culture and the silly things we try to attribute to the Indians, but major um, cities with infrastructures and the remnants are still here. And that's what really upset me. The idea that many of these classical buildings were actually found by our founders <laughs> and repurposed for a new 
crop of immigrants to come in. Right, like I've noticed, like the Mormon Tabernacle. Uh, you know, oh, God. I know it's like there's no photos of the construction of it, just the little uh, finishing work of it. Yeah, and well, supposedly and they consistently. I'm sorry. Yeah, and they built that in that what in the 1800s with no power and hand tools and horses and carts, and they say, yeah, we just built this. Mm -hmm. And that that's the same. Yeah, uh, attitude you get when studying all these state capitals, all these national monuments. Um, the, it, it becomes astounding. When, and especially when you see how many architects get the same architect over and over getting credit for these found buildings. And you're like, oh, it's that guy again. Oh, oh, I see. He's a member of the club. He goes in and they say, we'll tell you what you'll get credit for this marvelous structure over here. Just don't tell anybody we're digging it out of the mud. Right. So how does this change your worldview? I mean, cause I've been, I've only been turned on to this for a uh, few weeks. I've been, uh, uh, I did an interview with uh, Charlie Zeese on Stargate pyramids and oh. uh, I'll put a link below for that when you guys watch this or hear this. Uh, and uh, he started saying, oh, there's more to it. There's the Tartarian Empire. So I started researching it. That's how I found you. I've been in a tailspin thinking, oh, my God. I mean, I we already had COVID. We already got all this stuff. I already came to the sense that everything I've been taught is a lie. But now it's like, oh, my history's a lie, too? I'm afraid so. How do you deal with it? It's, it's hard. But it is liberating. It Say is more. absolutely liberating to realize that we're not the horrible species that came up from the mud and muck and pounded rocks together to figure things out. And now we're, this is the best we can do. That's just not the way it plays out. We're a cyclical spiritual race inhabiting this planet. We've had golden ages. We've had moments of absolute world unity. And all this has been erased during this time of chaos, which is part of the deal. It's not a wrong thing. It's just a learning experience for us to absolutely recognize what we do not want. Mm, that's a good way to put it. On our planet so that we can reject it in mass. Yeah, I was and reading another commentator today was saying, look, we don't want to go back to what was. We want something new and better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard somebody saying the same thing. He said, when they say go back to normal, let's refuse. Can you tell me a little bit about your research and uh, free energy, atmospheric oh, energy, that energy. part had me spinning. Oh, uh, no. I, well, like I said, I, have, I started on that way back in the 80s, I guess, when the Linda Goodman book about her living in Nikola Tesla's house in Cripple Creek, Colorado. And that was the first I had ever heard of him. Mm -hmm. And I was very upset because I felt like I was a well-educated woman. I'm like, why in the world haven't I come across that before? And the more I learned, the more I realized that we were offered an alternative energy source that would be available anywhere. You wouldn't have to have all these stupid plugs and stuff. And so that got me infuriated for a couple of decades. <laughs> that was my <laughs> big And then I came across Sylvie at New Earth, who explained the Russian concept that Tartarian buildings, especially, are built to collect the atmospheric energy, which we know exists. We just don't use it. Right. I'm going to put a link to uh, Sylvie's YouTube channel below Sylvie. this video oh. and on the audio uh, so people will be able to see that. Uh, yeah. What got me in looking at her stuff was uh, mm -hmm. this idea that uh, you see it everywhere, the dome or the cupola or the onion-shaped mm -hmm. top. And the mm -hmm. interesting antennas or crosses with three or four extra arms and interesting mm -hmm. angles. And then a combination of gold and mercury. I've been uh, mm -hmm. to India and been to some of the temples there. And it's like, mm -hmm. instead of the onion shaped top, it's the stupa. And mm -hmm. it's the same ba basic thing with the same basic ingredients. And it's like, these people have energy and they're using mm -hmm. it in their buildings. Everybody had their own little form. You know, you go from pyramids to pagodas to stupas, all of those things seem to be collecting and transmitting energy. Right. And there are still places that that great little uh, Praveen has shown us in India where you can't take a cell phone in there because it won't work. Right. It's kind of feel still active. And um, 
I think we can feel it to a degree. I know when I walk into something like the Texas State Capitol, I feel an in incredible difference in the energy and being in that dome and having all that stonework around me and everything. I used to work in there, so it made an impression on me. Mm -hmm. And um, where were we? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not just that you feel it. I think that you also uh, can use it practically. I've been reading blogs mm -hmm. where people use it for heating. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been uh, heard, reading about St. Elmo's Fire, which was a liquid concoction they would put in glass bowls and then be able to put them in these fields and then they would glow. So you had indoor lighting without running electrical lines. Mm -hmm. I mean, just yeah. wild. What you uh, elaborate fireplaces that didn't burn wood. No one's ever bothered to try to explain that in the traditional narrative. Right. But they never burned wood. They were some kind of energy accumulators that put off heat. That they, they never had the furniture grouped around it like a fireplace. So apparently, it did a really good job. But we're just told it's just a funny little fireplace, and they have to adapt it to try and make it work later. Right, which usually burns the building down because it wasn't it built to be a fireplace. It was built to move energy. And tell me more about the. Biltmore Mansion, because when I was yep. reading about the organ playing, that was mm -hmm. interesting. That is very interesting, and that made me realize that it's more than just collecting the atmospheric energy, it's tuning it. And I think that things like pipe organs were used exactly to do that, to tune and refine that energy, and then you mix that in with a choir singing in a building collecting energy, and I think you can have some amazing things happen that we probably can't even fathom. Right. Sound healing is what comes to my mind, because I've read a lot of esoterica about sound healing in ancient Egypt, uh -huh. and uh -huh. it's like this may have been why cathedrals are built the way they're built and have the acoustics they have. Exactly. I, I ran across a modern-day acoustic researcher studying cathedrals, and she said when they got the sound just right in these old cathedrals, she would have an experience where she would see the paintings and the statues kind of come to life and she would hear their stories psychically as she nice. heard the music because she thinks that was, it was all part of the same experience. The art went with the music, went with the architecture. It was all one big experience. Well, that's what uh, I'm learning is about frequency right behind me. Uh, I've got a pyramid that uh, one of my guests sent me when we were talking about Stargate pyramids. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, I asked him, how does it work? And he said, well, Peter, it's frequency. The angle in the geometry you see as a shape, but the degrees of the angle can be interpreted as an equation or as musical notes, like on the Sofagio scale. And it's those relationships in the angles, whether it's through a physical structure, through sound frequency, that then create different fields that you're in. Uh, do you have any comments about that? Yeah, I absolutely believe that. My uh, philosophy teacher taught me that back in college, Dr. Miller. He said that uh, square buildings kept your mind square. It's great if you need to deal with finance and logistics and statistics, but it's no good for a creative mind. And so consequently, I've done my best to always have homes that are not quite square. Um, I actually had built my own pyramid back in college and experimented with it and found out all kinds of fascinating things. My favorite one was putting the scissors in it, the black handle scissors. And when I took them out a month later, not only were they sharpened, but the outside edges had sharpened too. Wow. So, yeah, I was like, wow. And I've, I've studied all that pretty extensively. And so... And now we're learning so much about the shapes that sound makes. Like when you put it on a plate and play a tune or, or run a bow across a plate and the sound causes the sand to make these patterns. And those patterns look exactly like the rose windows in the cathedrals. They're cymatic patterns. Right. So it's like, the, again, the art is the physical oh. expression of a frequency wave pattern. Mm-hmm that probably affects the human soul when it's all working correctly. And I would think to 
release us to our divinity to a degree. I think that's what so many of the cities were made for. Right, the great structures, which we don't build them like that anymore. We don't build beauty, awe-inspiring structures anymore. It's like either we got cheap or we, are, or we were cheapened down by those in control. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about that for a second, because uh, in your... Uh, in your blog, you talk about the controllers, yeah. and I know other people call them the parasites, and yeah. I've heard all kinds of things, whether they're yeah, ET or not. We all know who it is, though. Yeah, we all know that there's a group of people, whether you're just a plain person who says, oh, the 1%, there's a group mm-hmm. of people that are interested in keeping us in their, you know, beholden to them. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what you see their role in shaping our history or denying our history? Well, I do believe it's part of the cyclical process. I think I have, you know, I've been all over the board with it. I've gone to everything from the archons to the invading space aliens to the reptile people. I've been through the whole shebang. And I basically think it's just about the ruling families, the elite, that we don't really know most of their names, and we never will. And through them, they have all these people that agree to help this illusion manifest because they'll get something out of it. Um, as far as what the controllers are up to, I think they really, really would like to drag us all into an AI world. That seems to be the bottom line, what um, Rudolf Steiner referred to as Ariman. Are you familiar with Ariman? I am not. Okay. Well, that, that's a whole. It's, it's, it's a dark force that works on our planets. It's not Luciferian. That's a whole different aspect. Oh, hello. I have a guest today. The cat came to say hi. Okay. All right. Go back to where you were, please. That's where uh, Armand is the force that tries to destroy everything growing in nature. It's rust. It's mold. It's disease it's all those kind of things that affect every level of life on the physical planet right and it comes at us in waves right well i know like i've studied some of the hindu works and they're talking about us moving out of the kali yuga into the satya yuga the golden age so it's Mm -hmm. clear to me we're we're definitely on the verge of becoming and there's a big cleaning out going on no matter Mm -hmm who you attribute it to. It's interesting to ask people like you who you believe. I'm sorry. No, no, I'll just go ahead. Um, Yeah, the Kali Yuga. And I really think that that is the one thing they know for sure is that their time is limited. And that's why things have gotten so ramped up. And so I kind of look at it as the great, my favorite story is Lord of the Rings. And there's that moment where Sauron moves too fast because he's been tricked into thinking that the enemy is stronger than they are. And I hope we're at that point where they've unleashed too much too soon and people are going to wake up and go, wait a minute, this isn't what life is about anymore. Well, that's kind of happening whether it's too much too soon. There's, it's just inevitable that people right and left are awakening. People in my family I never thought would gra- uh, grasp it are talking to me about things they're noticing. So everyone's getting it in their own way, which is kind of exciting. Let's talk a little bit about what it takes to actually be authentic and come forward and say, hey, I'm going to believe my lion eyes. I'm not going to listen to you and your seductive voice telling me not to believe what I see. What was it like for you to start to recognize that things were going on in the world and you were going to speak publicly about it? Yeah, it was a long decision because I'm, like I say, I'm usually a very private person. Uh, I can tell everybody's looking at your photograph. You're very private. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I, um, I, I'd say it pretty much started with, I mean, I had my 14 year old experience that woke me up and then I had the monastery, which told me it was okay to question things. And then I gotta say, being the crazy cat woman of Maui gives you a lot of leeway. <laughs> <laughs> I was holding that position when nine um, eleven happened, and I didn't like that scenario the minute it happened. I didn't believe any of it, and I questioned it. And 
everybody was amused because of crazy cow. <laughs> he is talking about this kind of stuff. But it did right. help me find more people that shared my opinion. And I got to know really cool people like Dennis Kucinich, you know? I mean, people who were part of the mainstream but still understood the travesty that was going on around us. Right. I used to teach media literacy for decades. But it was I taught it before it was a word. And I did uh -huh. a advertising and I know that, you know, 90% of the media is controlled by six corporations, which is really about 150 people making all those decisions. And I know we're always sold stuff to tell us that we're worthless and we need to buy products to feel better. And that's, you know, we suck by this. So you'll be better. I could see all that. I could see health was selling us garbage. I could see uh -huh. the big pharma and that food companies were selling us garbage. We were sold pollution and everything. I could see all that, but I couldn't make the step to say, Oh, and this is organized by these people to keep you down. That was a big leap for me. What helped you make that leap? It was a slow, gradual process. It took peeling off layer after layer after layer. There was no one thing that I can point to that made me say, okay, that's it. <laughs> I'm going public. It just happened. It just unfolded because the first thing I did was stop denying myself things that that um, boosted my ego. You know, that meant no social media, no, all that kind of goofy stuff. Oh dear, I've lost my train of thought again. Um, it just happened. I don't know how else to say it. I, I, I would find out something about God and share this with somebody. Well, I found out it's not really easy to talk to your friends about this stuff, so I write it down and I just throw it out to the universe and see who listened. And right. then they would send me things back and say, Did you know about? And I'd go, Well, no, I didn't know about. And then I'd go look that up. And it just turned into a process. And I thought I'd write like three blogs and I've got 70 now. It's just one thing led to the next. So what really strikes me in what you're saying is when you put it out there, you may have not been received by your circle of friends or your family, but there were tons of people who found what you were producing as valuable and gave you more, which mm -hmm. suggests to me that there's a lot of us, a yeah. lot of us that we're not conspiracy kooks or, you know, just wackos that are out there. There's a lot going on with a lot of people. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you see taking place in the psyche of America right now? Boy, um, well, obviously we're pretty divided at the moment, which is exactly what the controllers want. I am very hopeful that this is going to backfire in the sense that we have been told to be so scared of each other now. It's not the bomb anymore or any of these other things. It's each other. And we know better. We know we need each other. And we know that our interaction is important to our health. And I think we're heading for a moment where the anger is going to die off and the love is going to come back. Because yeah, that's what happens when you fully express something. You can't help but love them. Uh-huh. Exactly. Exactly. And I've certainly seen... Just a few people I interact with, even publicly, trying to just go that little extra distance and be a little extra nicer, and we're really all in this together kind of thing, but not the lockdown nonsense. Now, we're all getting through this ridiculous repression together, and we're going to do the best we can to not upset each other in the process. And I really think we're going to come out of it better. Great. Okay. Yeah. I can't help anybody who goes down the rabbit hole. It's scary and problematic at oh, first, but you know, once you're in it, you're like, Oh my God, I can let go of all these problems and go to someplace better. And that already exists. Oh yeah. Sign me up. Yeah. So, and just un unplugging from all the media and all the fear and all the, the programming that you have to be somebody, you have to make money, you have to accomplish something. Just unplugging from all that and going, okay, now what am I? Yeah. And, you know, what do I have to offer that's really unique? The whole make money thing is interesting because uh, the controllers that are giving us this history also seem to take a piece of it. 
there's mm-hmm. our taxes, there's the gasoline and electricity instead of free energy, mm-hmm. you know, there's uh, mm-hmm. all this food, which then causes health problems, which they get a piece on both ends of that. It's the same corporations, it's the same entities. Uh, so yeah, what advice do you have for somebody who's just new to this, somebody who just stumbled onto this blog and is just beginning to see that maybe there's a world out there bigger and grander than I possibly believe. What can you say to help ease their transition? Well, I would say what I was taught in that great book called Das Energies by Paul Williams. Mm -hmm. And he explained to me in that that fear is the mind killer, which we've heard before from Dune. But he goes a little further and says that fear is like an alarm clock. And when you hear that alarm clock go off, the first thing you do is turn it off so that you can think and plan and collect your wits. But I feel like we've been put in this cycle where that fear alarm is getting hit all the time and people don't know it's okay to turn it off. Right. That's really, there's really nothing to be scared of. And that's one of the great realizations I came in, especially living on Maui. I mean, that was hard to do with not much income. And I finally learned that the universe was going to provide for me if I just let it. And I had to learn to let it. And my favorite story was, I said, okay, universe, I want a French espresso press. (laughs) I don't have the money for one. Well, I I would like one, please. And sure enough, the next day, here came my landlord walking down the driveway with a big box of stuff he wanted to store in his cabinet and saying, do you want any of this? And I said, well, I'll take that French press you've got. <laughs> <laughs> and from that moment, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to start trusting. And if I don't have it, I probably don't need it. And I was just told I needed it by some piece of programming that got in there. That's a great philosophy. Let me use this as an interlude to ask for donations. I'm doing this podcast as a labor of love because my inner voice, my sacred higher self tells me there's messages to be spread about becoming awesome and this is your task. So I'm happy to do it. I get juiced up by doing this. Uh, I can use resources to get better equipment, get a social media manager. So if you're inspired by this, please make a donation. I got the links here, which is you can go to becomingawesome.podbean.com and click the patron button. Uh, and, and I don't want to like harp on this, but we haven't been taught correctly, I believe. And that's mm-hmm. as you give, so you shall you receive. We know that, but it's exact. Exactly how you give is how you should receive. I read your work. I was inspired by it. There was no way for me to make a donation. And I know that I need to give money to people that inspire me so that I get inspiration coming back to me and money from others who are inspired. So I had to contact you and you said, oh, you can do this through PayPal. So could you tell us how people can find your website and maybe give you a donation? Um, well, yeah. On my, I have the We Warrior WordPress website. And through that, in the links, I mean, in the comments, sometimes you can find where I have posted my email address, which is wewarriorblog at gmail.com. And apparently all you have to do, as you showed, Peter, is just send me an email and they tell me there's money waiting for me. It was delightful. Right. You can click on PayPal and then type in uh, wewarriorblog at gmail.com and you make a donation that way. I had no idea. It was so easy. And, um, yeah, so that's that. That would be lovely. Of course, it's always appreciated. I don't do it for money, but it, as you say, it is a powerful tool when used correctly. And I am certainly inspired by your contribution, and I'm getting ready to fire up a bunch more blogs. Nice, 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 nice. In the right direction, so I really appreciate it. Great. So, is there anything you can uh, pass on? Last words here that you'd like to send out to people? We've covered a wide range of topics, so I definitely want to. Mention your website again, uh, We Warrior at uh, uh, Work, We We Warrior blog on WordPress. And, uh, you know, just you're going to have fun reading it. I want everybody to do that. But anything you want to leave people with, Leela? I'd also like to mention my YouTube page. Please do. Uh, I did probably 50 videos that are kind of expressing the same things we're talking about spiritually here. Um, It's called Leela Bear. And, um, I, I oh. gave up on it probably, well, just as soon as I started the blog because I was fussing with YouTube too much. 
Yeah. Well, I'm going to put the link to that uh, again below the video and the audio. If you go back to becomingawesome.podbean.com and look up this episode, uh, you're going to find out that you can just link right to uh, Leela's channel. Mm-hmm. Great. That sounds good. And yeah, that's about the only way to find me. Like I say, I post on stolenhistory.org, which is an am- amazing site if you haven't found it yet. Some very, very smart people putting together the pieces over there. And uh, every now and then I go poke the bear over at Reddit because they just love this stuff. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's where I can get in the nice little, you know, back and forth with people, which I really enjoy. I mean, they try to be mean, but I don't allow myself to go there. And uh, sometimes I learn things I would never have learned any other way. So I do nice. My best. So parting words for everybody listening, what's the, your message in a nutshell? What do you want to say? Oh, I want to say we've all got everything we need inside of us. We just have to recognize it, give it power, and let the love flow. And I think that's going to be our solution to everything. Fantastic. We've got to be very, very smart. Yep. At, at their own game. Yep. My very first podcast episode was called It's Already In You. And the very first message I wanted to say is what you just closed with, you got it all already. Let's turn it up and shine bright. You just got to learn to listen to it. Yep. It's not always going to make sense. Sometimes it sounds like the dumbest idea possible, but that doesn't mean it's not a good idea. (laughs) Right. I want to thank you so much, my guest, Leela Lake, for spending this time with us and thank you all so much i forgot to say this we're in the youtube media age we're in facebook and podcasts if you haven't done so please like please subscribe please follow please share and leave your comments below unless they're nasty or you're selling something i'm gonna try to interact with you and respond let's have a discussion thank you all so much stay blessed thank you leela thank you Look forward to hearing from you again, Peter.